Yeah. Let's kick off. Go ahead, Christian. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome, everyone, um, to this uh, late afternoon session on, on Europe and uh, the question of Eurobonds. I know that those of you who have participated in the, in the conference have heard the word Europe on, on quite a few occasions um, today already. But I think this final session gives us the opportunity to decide this all together because tomorrow is uh, quite a decisive meeting of the European Council. Uh, we all know that there is a potential decision to be made on how the European Recovery Fund should look like after they decided on, um, on, on other measures um, such as the EU Shore program and, um, and the dedicated ESM line. Um, and this could potentially be a, a decisive moment for Europe because um, this crisis may at first look symmetric, uh, but in its impact it could be quite asymmetric in that the health impact might be much larger in some countries that are, that are hit badly. The economic impact could be quite different, uh, such that countries that are more dependent on the services sector have a harder time to rebound. And these support firms at the moment and, 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 and uh, workers could be uh, limited in countries with high debt levels. Uh, and of course, the starting point is quite different. Um, some countries were struggling already economically with a high debt burden, whereas others were growing quite swiftly. So um, as a result of all this, we may end up in a situation where the euro, which was meant as the convergence machine, which it was more or less uh, unsuccessful so far, uh, could turn into a full-fledged divergence machine. And, and this would be a, um, a, a political risk, uh, for not just for the eurozone, but I think for the entire EU. Um, so the question is, is now the time for deeper European integration? Eurozone integration is sort of this um, Hamiltonian moment that, that some have talked about. Um, or are there other ways to solve it in a, on a temporary basis uh, without changing the architecture of the, of the Eurozone entirely? And of course, the question of what happens if we don't um, find a solution for this crisis? Um, do we think that um, a country like Italy with a debt level of then 160% uh, of GDP um, has a prosperous future, not just a sustainable, but a proper, prosperous future inside the, inside the Eurozone. Um, the Forum New Economy has put together a, a stellar panel to discuss this. Um, it seems there's one Italian and three Germans, so uh, that might be somewhat unbalanced, but I can assure you there will be um, diverging views on, on, on the panel on, on some of these issues. That's why you're so we hearing have... Christian rather than speaking. Yeah? Okay, fair enough. So I, I don't count as a German, I'm the chair. Dominated, yeah. All right, okay. I'm Italian by heart. Italian by heart. Uh, that's so we have one proper, one Italian by heart. I'm, I'm Italian, but actually from very close to the Austrian border, so I'm not exactly sure what All right, okay. <laughs> no, that, that, well, half Austrian in, in Germany, is it? Well, um, and then we have, <laughs> and then we have, uh, so Silvia Mella, of course, from Algebra's uh, head of research, Moritz Schulerich, who just uh, said he's an Italian by heart, uh, professor at, at the University of Bonn, and I think currently in New York, is that correct? Yeah, currently right. in New York. Um, then we have Christian Kastrop, who was the former uh, deputy um, chief economist of the finance ministry, was at the OECD and is now the head of the Europe program mm -hmm. at Bertelsmann. And then we have Jakob von Weizsäcker, who is the current chief economist of the finance ministry. So I would like to um, to invite Christian Kastrop to start and give us his take for, for um, seven minutes, if that's okay, because there will be lots of questions and discussions. Uh, so I, I would like uh, the panelists to, to keep to their time. Um, Christian, um, you have uh, worked during a different uh, Euro crisis um, a couple of years ago. Um, how, does it, how, how does it feel now to watch uh, sort of the same debates come up again, or is it, is it quite different? No, oh, thank you, Christian, uh, for that introduction. And uh, indeed, uh, I uh, still know what has happened in these years and uh, what decisions have been has been have been taken and what decisions have not been taken. Even if there had been proposals, we may come back to this maybe in the discussion. What I would do right now for a bit also setting the scene, a bit from a political view, so not from a scientist's view or from my own former OECD view, I would just give you a bit of a political polemic. Um, let me start with this. Uh, 11 theses. One, of course, uh, Eurobonds must be part of uh, the Eurozone's toolbox. That's clear cut. Uh, two, 
I think the EU already has since long time before the Eurozone and even before uh, the, the union was very close, had instruments and capacities uh, with mutual backing, uh, risk share, and there, these credit instruments and uh, bond instruments were used uh, in, the, in the post past with also with a lot of success. So we should not forget about that we already have mutualization, even if on a lower scale. My third point would be um, the issue of eurobonds, unfortunately, is very often uh, represented in a black and white format. So uh, if you are pro eurobonds, you are very euro friendly, you are a good European, and it's sometimes also on the other way. If you are a skeptic, uh, then you are also a euro skeptic, and uh, you are not really a good European. And I would like really to get the Germans a bit out of that box. Uh, so I will not fully succeed. Because as I said in my thesis, first, uh, I of course support Eurobonds quick and soon and big, but we have to keep in mind uh, also the other elements. So my fourth point would be, so it is just one instrument of crisis. We should not always focus on just Eurobonds. Uh, they are a necessary thing, but they are only an instrument among several others. Uh, see all the sessions today, I could not follow them all, but uh, we heard about uh, the role of other EU institutions, we heard about the EU budget, uh, we have the ESM, we have the EIB, we have the Commission, and of course, we have the ECB and the debate also about, which was also mentioned in the last panel, about fiscal capacities. And also maybe some institutions still missing, like the sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. So my fifth uh, thesis or my fifth point would be that the question is, if you use something also in this crisis, when, about when and how, and then about the shape and the scope of a crisis reaction mechanism. So how do they look like in detail? We really have to look at the Germans like to look at the details. And even here, we should not do just politics, but look to the details of what we do. So which institutions will use Eurobonds, who pays, funds, guarantees, who receives, most of all, of course, uh, in what kind of crisis they should be used or applied. And I think there is no uh, one size fits all instrument here. And therefore my sixth thesis is, or my sixth point is, that all medicines we use, and I have just mentioned a few, and they were discussed already at length today, all these medicines also have some un unwanted side effects in the short term and also in the long term. And um, these are not just marginal. So if we use a weapon against something, against the crisis, against the pandemic, we have to think twice what will be the short term and what will be in the long term. And of course, there is an issue, whatever we do in these uh, support mechanisms, there will be somewhere an issue of moral hazard. I know the Germans uh, overdo that argument uh, very nicely, but we should not just say there is none. So, uh, and even if I agree that some side effects are not real, but there are ju just imagined, uh, that's also true. So coming to my seventh point, this is Nicola Brandt uh, made uh, good work from my old employee, the OECD, that this is not a normal crisis. And this is why we should not do just the discussion we did 2008 and following, uh, which was quite another type. So uh, uh, the, the normal crisis is coming with a typical shock, uh, either diminished or either exaggerated by country-specific uh, preparedness on micro side, on macro side, on structural side, on fiscal conditions, on the institutional design of the economy and the political system. So of course, there are, there have been, there are, and there will be better or worse policies, and we should also look at that. So a normal crisis then, of course, may be tackled with a common help, with an instrument. But of course, it's not always a bad thing if this fiscal support in the normal crisis is also be conditioned to reforms and structural change. So. I agree that, of course, this argument also has been used in an exaggerated way. And I also agree, not least, by our German friends. So my eighth point would be, here clearly, I following Nicola, we have a super crisis. Here, the moral hazard argument does clearly not count. 
And this is uh, why I think that support and solidarity in this case can simply not be linked to any conditionality, but only to need and urgency. We have an exceptional case. We have not a normal crisis. So my ninth point would be, we need, of course, the sequence of all possible measures, and we need it, whatever it takes. I, I'm clear on that. Whatever we need, we should do. So including, of course, what Council will decide tomorrow, uh, we will need euro bonds too. Uh, whether they are done via the EU budget or joint tenders, we can leave this open to the technicians. And of course, maybe there is a plus X, and this plus X has also been discussed today. Of course, the ECB, in contrast to the Federal Reserve of the United States and the Bank of England, is no fully, fully uh, engaged uh, lender of last resort. It can't be, and I can even expect, and I can even think about in the worst case, that we will need this lender of last resort function, and then we are in the debate just had in the early afternoon about monetization and helicopter money. So coming to my 10th thesis, um, there is a battle against pandemic. This is not 2008. So we clearly have a European common good uh, on the health side, which is coming with an economic problem, which is coming with a political problem too. So and if we don't take what's necessary on board, I think the EU case indeed might be lost. I'm a rather skeptic person and this will be bad for the EU, for everybody, will be bad for the global situation where we need a strong liberal voice in the world and this is done by Europe mainly right now and the Germans who have the biggest profit, which is not clear to every German right now, will lose the most. So Germany will, now I come to Germany, will need a sequence. Uh, yes, I agree, this is a political dynamics inside of this country. Uh, and it will be allowed to discuss the side effects of medicine. We'll need some checks and balances, but I agree here with Shahin of the last panel. I think they are on their way, and I think tomorrow could be a big step forward, and the euro bonds then might be the next one. If not, and this is now the 11th point I want to make, if we get no consensus, I think we clearly have to move forward to explore for the EU a differentiated integration model. We need more flexible geometry, coalitions of the willing. And I, I stop here with Macron. He's very right, stand still in this case, especially now in this pandemic case, even more than before, is stepping backwards and Europe cannot afford that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, Sylvia, the um, the situation in Italy, I mean, has been on, on, on everyone's mind, not just because, um, you know, Italy has been the elephant in the room in the, in the last Euro crisis, uh, but mostly because the, 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 the yeah. hick, the, 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 the hit um, um, to, um, to, to, to the population and, and to the Italian economy has been so severe. So can you give us a, an, an idea of where, where Italy stands at the moment and what you think is, is needed from an Italian perspective? So, um, I mean, coming to the impact on uh, on the health side, obviously, Italy being the first country in Europe where um, there's been a domestic out of COVID-19, we have, like, led the way in a, in a negative sense there. So, um, both that goal and also the measures that have been taken are actually much more severe than in other countries. This is, uh, this will bring me to the, to the economic point later. So one thing that differentiates Italy from currently Germany and France, for example, is that the uh, lockdown measures that we have imposed are much stricter. So starting on March 25th, um, the Italian government has actually suspended all productive non-essential activities where non-essential is defined in a list of um, sectors and actually sub-sub-sub-sectors that can operate and others that can't. Um, why am I mentioning this? I'm mentioning this because if you look at uh, other countries, they're not doing this. And this is the one thing that I believe is going to be more important to understand what the actual impact on the Italian economy might be of this crisis. Because depending on whether we reopen sooner or later, the fact that our lockdown is stricter is currently preventing Italian producers, producers from uh, fulfilling orders that they get from their uh, international clients. And so those international clients might very well decide to switch part of their supply side, either re it, which I believe will be mm, in the longer term 
tendency that we'll see more and more across Europe anywhere, anyway, um, or simply, you know, like temporarily switch to other suppliers, but not come back uh, in the end. So this is, this can have a very sizable effect because if you look at the Italian manufacturing sector, about 50% of the uh, value added that is domestically produced in the Italian manufacturing sector is actually driven from consumption abroad. So the impact of uh, potential reinsuring or um, shifting of the supply chain away of uh, Italian producers might be major on the Italian manufacturing sector, which in turn is uh, uh, one of the most important sectors contributing to, uh, to the Italian GDP. So um, we, we try to estimate the impact of these various factors um, on GDP and the picture is obviously not nice. I mean, you've seen a lot of numbers floating around. We are in the same range. So um, real GDP growth in 2020 in ex is expected to be depending on the scenario that you, um, that you pick. So more or less severe between eight, minus eight and minus 15. Uh, and for a country that starts from 135% of that to GDP ratio in 2019, this means that you would be climbing to uh, 150 to 165, depending on, again, um, <clears throat> what, grow, what growth scenario you, uh, you land to. With the most severe one being a scenario where you actually lose economic potential, so for the, for the kind of uh, effects that I was talking about earlier. So, I mean, clearly enough, this um, puts a country that was already on very weak basis uh, on an economic standpoint, because uh, just remind that Italy has not been growing in a significant way for about 20 years. So uh, real per capita income in Italy in 2019 was at the same level it was in 1999. So that's where we're starting from. Uh, and we know from literature, from economic research, and um, uh, a lot of evidence that, you know, when you start getting to those high levels of debt to GDP ratio, it also uh, kickstarts negative cycles for, uh, for growth. So it, it becomes more and more difficult to climb out of this, uh, of this trap. So obviously, from an Italian standpoint, anything that shifts at this part of that burden away from the national books onto something that is uh, mutualized or European or you name it is welcome. That is uh, clearly something that, I mean, it's self-explanatory if you look at the numbers. The big question then is, is Italy in a position to claim anything of that sort? Uh, and I'm going to play a bit of German here, since Christian was so not German uh, in, in, his, in his seven introductory minutes. I, I just want to say, I mean, if you, you made a perfectly um, a sensible argument when you said this is a symmetric crisis. The big problem that we're facing is that the recovery might be asymmetric depending on different countries, uh, pre-existing conditions, to use a medical metaphor, right? Um, the difference between for example, Spain uh, and Italy is that Spain might have a not so good pre-existing condition because it has a, a high debt ratio, but that high debt ratio is coming from a crisis that Spain has, so to speak, paid for through a very demanding macroeconomic adjustment program. And like Spain, other countries did the same, but Italy has not. So in the Eurozone today, and this was true before, COVID, and it's even more true now, Italy was already a, an, an outlier from a macroeconomic standpoint, a country with an exceptionally high debt ratio, an exceptionally low growth, uh, and that for about 20 years has not uh, performed any really sizable macroeconomic adjustments. So the big question is, this Italy is, this is a country that, this is a crisis that obviously will make or break European integration, Italy will be right at the center of this discussion. Does it have uh, a position to be claiming for the kind of solidarity that we are claiming for, basically? Thank you very much, Sylvia. So not to worry, um, then, then not to worry that you, that you took a, a German view here because uh, the next speaker on my list is the Italian at heart, uh, Moritz. 
Um, you've been uh, outspoken in, in favor of Corona bonds early on uh, with, a, with, with a group of, of very prominent German economists. And I think that helped um, um, influence the debates um, in, in, in Germany. So I think that's, that's very welcome. Um, but it's, um, the, the, the political realities, of course, are a bit different. So um, do, do you think this, you know, Corona bonds is the only way or are there other ways that you feel are um, equally uh, helpful in this and with, with a view of, uh, for tomorrow? Yeah, um, first of all, thanks for, for having me on this. Um, uh, it's, it's, I mean, Christian, I'm, I'm just going straight to the question. I think a lot of the arguments, we, we know why, why um, a common response is a good idea, why we don't want a symmetric shock to become asymmetric, and that we don't want to repeat the mistakes that we've done after 2008, and that Italy and other places are probably not going to survive another decade of economic stagnation. Uh, all these arguments are there, and, and I'll just cut them short and come straight to the question. So, um, I think the I hope that our that our uh, efforts at peace and that this, the the letters had an impact. Um, I have at least sort of witnessed over the weeks the debate shifting from, oh, this is not possible at all; it's completely outrageous. To, hmm, let's see how we could implement this. To uh, okay, like he, here's a concrete proposal, uh, even including ways for the commission to to finance that. I think the, the big battle at the beginning, and um, I think Jakob will tell us more later, but I think the big battle for us and, and at the beginning was to even convince people that this is not just a liquidity question. So people very quickly had this down as a liquidity problem. Oh, spreads in Italy are going up. Uh, all we need to do is make sure that there is access to some finance at some uh, reasonable conditions and then everything is fine. Um, and that was the first, I think, sort of the first reaction, especially in, in, in the capitals and in the policy world. Um, um, and then like two days later or so, the ECB came out with the PEP program and in a way the liquidity issue was off the table. Um, but then for two weeks, um, politics still like turned around those liquidity issues and we were wasting an enormous amount of political capital on discussing ESM proposals and other things that I think were never meant to fly and were also not the right, um, the right um, tool for the, for the, for the um, problem at hand. Um, so then sort of the next stage then was to convince people that uh, we need to talk about transfers, about grants. It's not just back-to-back -back loans through whatever vehicle, the ESM or the Shore program or whatever. There was a long time, another two weeks passed where we were talking about back-to-back -back loans. And again, then the argument was, it, Italy, if, um, if I was the Italian prime minister, which I'm not, obviously, but I would also be um, worried about um, ramping up Italian debt to GDP towards 170, 180, 190 percent of GDP, uh, which means that my country for the foreseeable future will have to walk a very tight uh, line between, in terms of debt sustainability, market access, um, etc. And I think anticipating that um, the response from Rome will be less than optimal, which means that as a Eurozone we will not capture the externalities that we could get uh, that we have if, if every country does what is economically uh, sensible and we get a quick recovery across the whole eurozone so that was the next stage make sure, explain to people that we are talking about um, ways to transfer resources one-off limited uh, without getting into uh, without getting into the um, you know the usual um, uh, joint and several um, discussions uh, and, and and moral hazard uh, issues that arise from there. Um, I think a big step then for my own, as far as the, for my own thinking, where the shore was the shore program of the commission, because all of a sudden it was possible for the commission, with guarantees by the member state, to borrow more than the financial framework actually allowed them to do. Um, I didn't quite understand, and maybe the commission also didn't, and. Um, why the Shore program was designed as back-to-back -back lending instead of actually making transfers into these, um, into the uh, unemployment systems of the individual countries who requested aid. Um, but I think that was, an, that was an important step. And I think now we are at the, 
um, at the moment where we are discussing for the first time, like for the past week or two maybe, um, ski ways to um, have to finance the European response um, either by the European budget um, or by some Corona fund or some other, some other means that would really mean uh, the, the money flows to where it's most needed to ensure a that every all countries can respond to the health crisis um, as much as needed in the interest of European citizens and b when we open up and and have to support the economy we can do what is um, what is um, in the interest of the union as a whole to to get out of this and not have another uh, recovery that's slower than the US and China and and, and lag behind um, again so last point from my side would I think um, once that principle is established and I, I noted with um, with the joy that um, then there were, you know, many people agreed like, okay, we could just do a one-off increase of the European budget. We, um, every country transfers 5% into a Corona fund. And from that Corona fund, we then, you know, through criteria that we have to, they have to establish, um, address, have a European response to, um, to the crisis. I think once we were at that step that people understood, okay, we, we need some, tra with a big transfer element. I think we, the logical next step now is just, to have the discussion about oh should we should we contribute nationally to that fund? Yeah, we could all just transfer five percent. We could borrow nationally and put it in to the budget. We could raise taxes, whatever. Or does this does the Commission borrow potentially perpetually, uh, which has the you know the nice um, side effect that we could now log in negative real interest rates forever, and um, the amounts that are uh, in the room, uh, the, yeah, we're talking about 10 to 15 billion of annual, uh, annual debt service for a trillion dollars, one to one and a half percent of interest, maybe. All of a sudden, these sums would look much more manageable. Um, so, um, and, and I think my preference, and I have said this, my personal opinion, I've said this a, a few times and stated is, um, if these two options are on the table, of national contributions into the budget or a corona fund, or we uh, borrow at this point in time with um, um, by the commission by either giving them revenues from the emissions trade, which would be roughly 20, 30 billion a year, I would think that would be enough to finance the, the debt service on, you know, a trillion of, of, of bonds potentially, or, um, or we do it via guarantees. I'd be, I'd be open to discuss the technicalities, but I think we are at the step where we should go. And my preference would, we should be, and my preference would clearly be to um, have that Corona fund financed by debt because it would um, one off limited, um, you know, over 100, Article 122, which I think is an amazing tool to counter the argument that, oh, it's not going to remain a one-off. Yes, it is going to remain a one-off because it says very clearly we need a natural catastrophe and those we don't have every day, um, luckily. And, uh, and the nice side benefit of borrowing and having these corona bonds would obviously to some degree uh, create safe assets for the European banking system and have these financial stability externalities on top of it. So I leave it there. That was kind of my journey and um, that's where I think we stand right now. Thank you very much, uh, Moritz. Jakob, um, now we've, we, we've made, as, as Moritz said, quite a journey in, in our discussion um, in, in, in Germany in particular on the issue of uh, Corona help and Eurobonds. Um, the question is, of course, you know, what, what, is, what is the end game of that discussion? Uh, I know you're in front of 150 uh, participants in a live stream, you may not give the official uh, finance ministry position, but uh, maybe you can just, you know, give us an idea of how you, how you see this discussion evolving politically uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks. Yes. Uh, uh, well, look, I, I think you're putting me in a little bit of a difficult spot here. Um, uh, um, I, I, th I think right now for me to try and predict what the outcome of the meeting tomorrow is going to be or the next couple of days, uh, I, I think I'd, I'd rather not go down that road. But, but I think what I can contribute is, is 
um, sort of outlining the many ways in which one can think about the problem of euro bonds or, or corona bonds in this particular situation. Uh, and I think, in, in very much in the spirit of what Christian Kastrup said at the beginning, I think this can contribute to, to um, making people who are spontaneously somewhat skeptical of these things. I think many of the listeners won't be, uh, but many uh, of side will be and, and make them a little bit more relaxed about uh, uh, that particular discussion. Um, and so uh, let me start by pointing out the obvious, um, that if you think um, uh, of trying to deal with this crisis, of course, there's sort of the mitigation phase, it's costing a lot of money. Then there's the sort of uh, stabilization phase, it's going to cost you uh, a lot of money. And perhaps you want to do something transformative um, as you move out, move out of crisis. So it's very expensive, clearly. And borrowing will play a big role, and um, uh, some member states may not be able to do that all that borrowing easily, uh, given um, the debt situation um, with which they start at the beginning of the crisis. I think that's quite clear. Um, and, and the standard instruments we have for this sort of situation is called, is called the ESM. And if the ESM lends money to other countries, of course, it has to borrow on the market. Um, and what the ESM issues are euro bonds, for, for lack of a better word. Sometimes we don't call them that, but I think it's important to realize that they are. Um, so it's not only that uh, during the oil crisis, as some economic historians have rightly pointed out, uh, there was joint European borrowing. Um, it, we have a standard uh, instrument to do just that. Now, then there's the interesting question, and I think Moritz, you alluded to it, uh, is that sufficient? Um, it, it's not trivial. Uh, to answer that question, because of course, um, if you think about it, if the ESM were to um, uh, lend money um, for 50 years at an ultra low interest rate, given uh, the current uh, interest rate environment and given um, the inflation rate, which is not uh, at 2%, a little bit below that, um, there's a lot of that can be gained if, if, if you happen to be a country with, I don't know, 150 basis points higher interest rate um, than the refinancing rate of the ESM, over, over a period of 50 years, it becomes almost like a transfer mathematically. And I, I'm, I mean, Moritz in particular, I don't need to tell you that. I mean, you can do the maths very easily. Um, so um, there, is, there is, of course, um, in what uh, is uh, borrowing or lending implicitly the possibility, and we're doing it with Greece, I'm not sure whether this was the most elegant uh, way of doing it, and I'll come to that in a moment, um, but there's a lot of leeway, there's a lot of flexibility uh, in this particular tool. Now, of course, we may come to the conclusion, um, and... Um, We've done that um, even even before this week. Uh, that maybe the SM in and by itself is not enough in the current situation. I don't want to go into the details of the EIB and and sure and and so on. We can discuss it uh, in a minute if you want to. Uh, but of course, then we come to the recovery fund. If we came to the conclusion that somehow there's not enough transfers involved in what the ESM can do with its euro bonds, standard euro bonds. Nobody really gets so much worked up about it anymore. Um, and, and we've lowered the bars, you know, enormously, that this is not enough and we want something more. We want something additional. I think there are good reasons to, to try and do that. Um, um, what are the ways in which uh, um, we can do it? One way, of course, is to focus more on the spending side, I think there's a lot of uh, 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 focus, and perhaps misguidedly so, on the uh, uh, borrowing side of things. If we were to have a recovery fund, forget it for a minute about where the money is coming from, we can spend it to where we feel the money is most needed. Um, and part of the criteria would presumably help be health criteria. If you look at, for example, the Spanish proposal I saw, that Harald uh, um, uh, was, was just circulating the link. Uh, there, there is a logic of, uh, you know, number of people infected and, and, and so on. But one could also contemplate saying on the spending side, uh, countries which are uh, in difficulties uh, in, 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 in the wider sense of the word during the corona crisis, and that could help to alleviate the problem. What could also help, um, uh, and uh, it's a discussion I, I, I've been having with Moritz, is of course to say, well, how about 
um, you know, going to the extreme, issue very, very long maturity bonds um, using the credibility um, of some of the more fortunate country in the euro area to borrow at very long rates, uh, low rates, and then, you know, hand out the money evenly, implicitly, uh, you'd get a lot of redistribution. Of course, of course, that's not necessarily free lunch, because I think to some extent the economic equivalent is some of the um, uh, uh, countries with better borrowing capacity simply issuing, uh, say, perpetuals and then making the transfer uh, without uh, joint borrowing. And that, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's close to it. So I think we need to be transparent about how we could, of course, uh, use the borrowing side um, in a recovery fund uh, to make transfers that aren't so apparent. Uh, thereby alleviating uh, the problem. And then, of course, uh, there's the big discussion about, uh, you know, uh, beyond the corona crisis, should this uh, be used as a Hamiltonian moment uh, to really move the euro area or the EU, there's some confusion in that, forward um, and move us to the next stage where uh, there would be joint decision-making, joint taxation for certain purposes, uh, joint borrowing um, um, I I in a way in which uh, we're, we're quite used to in the Federal Republic. There's certain responsibilities of the federal level, then there's responsibilities lower down. And one needs to be very careful of how one divides up these responsibilities. But there clearly is a case to be made, and Christian Kastrop alluded to that, the whole discussion on European public goods. Um, uh, uh, there's a case to be made. Uh, um, uh, in the context of the currency area, but in the context of the EU at large, to try and make that step at, at some stage. Now, um, I think the only hesitation uh, that, uh, and I think it's a legitimate hesitation in, in, in Germany, is that if one were to rush ahead in this Hamiltonian sense and simply do joint borrowing without uh, um, moving sovereignty, that is spending decision-making, taxation decision-making, lots of other things uh, um, to the European level at the same time, then we may be asking for trouble. And um, I think one of the reasons why, uh, why of course, in Germany, there, there tends to be a higher percentage of economists and lawyers worried about this is because in German federalism, we didn't worry about this for a long time. And it came back to haunt us with some of the troubles that our lender have, have been experiencing over the decades. Um, and, uh, and with the constitutional reform, I mean, there's a lot of talk about the German debt break. I think one of the most significant parts of it was actually trying to ta tackle the problem of, of the lender being able to borrow just like that. Christian is smiling, Christian Kastrop, because he's quite closely involved in that, you know, stopping parts of that madness. So, so in other words, um, I think we should be more relaxed about, uh, um, uh, um, you know, talking about euro bonds because we have them um, uh, and uh, uh, maybe we need to create more um, but I think we need to be very precise in what it is we want to do and I think we ought to be transparent um, in, in how if we want to make transfers how are we going to go about them and we should be honest about it because otherwise um, even if we win the economic argument we're going to lose the political battle and, and so that would be my plea uh, let's be honest, let's be transparent, um, and let's uh, yes. not forget uh, the, the, the longer run objective of trying to have a, 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 a reasonably um, a, a designed fiscal authority at the European level, uh, but let, uh, uh, without forgetting that if we um, move ahead in one sense, uh, just borrowing without the other sense, pooling of sovereignty, maybe we're asking for trouble. Thank you very much, Jokab. Um, can I just, uh, because there have already been questions uh, from, from the participants on the Spanish proposal, um, can, can, can we dive into that a little bit more? So the Spanish are proposing a, a, a big uh, potential, big fund of one and a half trillion and uh, potentially financed by perpetual bonds, um, borrowed by the EU, which then uh, gives up grants to uh, two countries. I think the idea of having this long-term funded through the EU with uh, potentially perpetual bonds uh, has, has a bit of an attraction both economically and politically, but at the same time, you can imagine that perpetual bonds are a difficult sell in, in, in Germany. How do you view that? It's, it's a question that you asked um, uh, for yes. me? 
Well, I, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm told there's certain legal uh, questions uh, um, uh, um, surrounding consults um, to do with, uh, you know, if something is temporary, according to 122, uh, is it just the spending that um, it needs to be temporary and the borrowing can be permanent or, or, or not? So there's an interesting question there. There's an interesting question I'm told to do with, uh, with the... Um, uh, uh, with the ECB and um, and um, uh, and consults, but uh, but in the end, you, you know, even though um, uh, um, in a way there's a big difference between 40 years and infinity or 20 years and infinity, um, I, I, um, I, if one takes a geometric mean between zero and infinity, uh, it's not infinity, but it's sort of relatively close to today. So I wouldn't um, I wouldn't worry too much about uh, uh, you know this discussion should should it just be long term borrowing or should it be infinite borrowing uh, I think there we need to be careful not to overstep certain uh, certain legal bounds but I think what uh, what this idea of you know infinity and and so on uh, I think there's one way in which it is useful there's a beautiful word which I think which I think fits a uh, German word which fits the uh, situation we're in uh, um, uh, right now very well. It's called Schicksalsgemeinschaft. It's this question, do we really feel that as a European Union, we're, we're in this together for the very long run um, and um, we can rely on each other in the very long run? And I think that's a, that's a very important and, and legitimate question um, but I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't think that uh, um, answering this question in the affirmative, which I hope we'll be able to do, um, necessarily implies that we should be, that we should insist on, uh, on you know, consults. I, I think that would be going a step too far. And Sylvia, um, the, the, the view from, how's the view from Italy on, on the Spanish proposal and also the, the idea of European solidarity? Um, at least in the German press, it was reported that um, opinion polls of Europe and solidarity in Europe have deteriorated quite a bit in, in, in Italy. So is, is the Spanish proposal something which the Italian government, also the Italian people, would feel that this is the solidarity that we need? So oddly enough, there's been remarkably little discussion of the Spanish proposal in the domestic debate, as there has been of the uh, the French proposal of a, a few weeks ago before the Eurogroup. There was another French proposal about the EU recovery fund, um, pretty much going in the same direction, um, aside from, from the details of funding. Um, because the entire domestic domestic debate has gone completely crazy on the ESM part of um, of what the package that we're currently discussion so the discussing so there there is in Italy this obsession with the ESM uh, what the ESM does what the ESM means how the ESM functions uh, and all that sort of things and I believe. The domestic debate has been completely captured by discussion of the ESM also because from the side of the government early on, um, their stance towards, like, towards the public in Italy has always been to talk about the ESM. So we're not going to ask for ESM help, we're not going to do this with the ESM, we're not going to um, accept anything that has to do with the ESM. Um, and so all the rest has, has kind of been swept away by this, by this <laughs> obsession recently. So this is my answer to what does Italy think about the Spanish proposal, I don't know. Um, as far as opinion of opinion, general opinion of Europe and European solidarity, well, Italy was already very Eurosceptic, as we all know before this. Um, it's the only country that has elected two formerly explicitly Eurosceptic and anti-Euro parties to government in 2018. So definitely was one step further uh, compared to pretty much anyone else in the Eurozone, at least on that side. Uh, this clearly didn't help. Um, in the sense that uh, I think what, what really um, explains this view about Europe today is that in the very first phases of the crisis, Europe wasn't there. That's, that's um, I think, um, clear uh, in a sense that it, it caught up to, to the fact that this is not an Italian crisis and this is not like any one specific crisis. This is a global crisis and a European crisis right now in particular. So. Uh, then we started seeing, I mean, if you compare today with 2010, solidarity, the question of Eurozone solidarity came to the forefront much faster 
uh, and at the center of the discussion much faster than it was back then when it was not even clear whether it was legal to lend money to, uh, to Greece. So that is a positive. The thing is that we now seem to be stuck on uh, this grants versus loans um, view of uh, how solidarity should take place, which is uh, goes back to what Jakub was saying about perpetuals, but it's more general. So uh, it's ultimately a, a question of whether we are prepared as a polity, a European polity, which we are not exactly, but we might ex aspire to be, um, to move on to accept transfers effectively, which is what grants mean, as opposed to loans, which is what the ESM does. Uh, and uh, what, what could be done in a different way, yeah. So, Moritz Mo, hinted at that Italian politicians and the finance minister may be held back by the fact that Italian debt to GDP ratio is already at 135 percent, so that Italian policymakers are not willing to spend as much money to protect their economy and their workers as um, the German politicians are at the moment. Do you, is, is, that a, is that a view that you would share? Because I, I've heard different views on that, to what extent this is really what's holding Italian response back. So the, there was an announcement today from the Prime Minister that so what has currently been uh, decided already is 25 billion in new spending. So that would be new deficit on top of um, uh, what we had. And um, plus there, there is a system of guarantees that should top up to 350 billion. Uh, and today there was this announcement that the, there will be an additional 50 billion in spending that should be announced uh, and decided, I think, today or tomorrow. So Italy is spending more now compared to what it was um, uh, envisioning at, at, in the early phases of the crisis, I think, also because we are realizing uh, we're starting to realizing that the impact on the economy is probably worse than people expected, at least at the beginning. Um, yeah okay. okay Moritz can I can I ask you sorry, sorry. just quickly Go ahead. To follow up on that um definitely the fact that we have a more limited fiscal space was is pretty much driving everything in the response because it, it, it's a it's obviously a big constraint on uh the freedom of policy action that's for sure thank you uh Moritz that just one qu more question on, on, on the Italian debt sustainability so um Earlier today, you gave a talk on, on so how countries in the past have dealt with uh, huge debt overhangs. And I just wondered whether, whether you could whether you give us a, a, a hint as to what you think the future holds if we do not agree on a proper response. So Italy, you know, inside the Eurozone at 160% debt to GDP or potentially even more going forward if Italy doesn't manage to grow. Uh, out of this crisis properly. So um, is there, there's a discussion in Germany that was one of the questions that one of the participants asked, um, is there a way of, you know, one of wealth taxes to reduce that? Is that realistic? Uh, has that been done in the past? Or is there, is, it, is Italy so constrained by being a member of the European, uh, of the Eurozone, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, living with that debt is the only option, but then again, living with a debt burden of 160% inside the Eurozone doesn't sound like very appealing prospect uh, if you want to grow. Yeah, I mean, I mean, let, let's face it. I think Italy is above 150, close to 160 already. If you have go into this with 135 and your GDP drops by 10, 15 percent, whatever the number is, I don't know. I'm also just guessing. Um, then um, the impact is 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 quite substantial already on the debt to GDP ratio. And as, as Sylvia said, that's before any of these guarantees have been drawn. That's before uh, we even talked about some kind of um, stimulus package for phase two that Jakob mentioned. So I think that's the um, that, that's one of the key points that we were trying to make. And, and if I can quickly also address Jakob's point about, you know, there's transfers all, also in, in the interest subsidies by the ESM, but the problem is that one for one Italian debt to GDP rises with an ESM lending facility. You know, it's 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 that, and I think that remains a problem in terms of the debt sustainability. I mean, it's we we all know the equation. It it depends on the d difference between the real interest rate on the debt and the growth rate of the economy. Um, we are in a very fortunate situation, and that was sort of the main point of my previous talk. That um, for reasons that we do not fully understand, that interest rates are very low, and uh, in most countries, our system. Lower than real growth rates going. So for Germany, debt sustainability is likely not an issue if we continue to grow at the 
like one to two percent clip. Um, for Italy, it is paramount that the country comes out of that depression, and um, um, I think that sustainability um, is um, is first and foremost a question of the you know if you think about the the law of motion there of the R over G in the um, in the in the equation and will need to will will need Italy to to grow even at sort of zero ish uh, real interest rates we're between zero and one percent that sustainability is you know it's 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 the situation is much better than it could be but it's uh, it's not clear so then you're left with one of um, factors to bring down debt to GDP one of adjustments or a large primary surplus I think in terms of the primary surplus Italy has done pretty well. Um, the fiscal adjustment in the past decade was, I would say, given where the cyclical position is, um, we are, you know, the country has done quite a lot. Then indeed the last option, if, if the growth rate doesn't go up and the interest rate um, doesn't fall further, is to um, reduce debt to GDP through one of factors. There could be privatizations, there could be wealth taxation, there could be all kinds of other, there could also be default, but that's, um, that's very ugly and messy. Um, so um, yeah, I think I think that's where we stand. And I personally, I think um, I, w I can't I can't see an Italian a responsible Italian prime minister bringing its country into a situation where over the next ten to twenty years it's clear that um, any um, European negotiation and any European strategy will be overshadowed by a debt to GDP ratio approaching two hundred percent. So I think the constraint there is very real. Um, even if it's publicly addressed right now or, or um, more implicit. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Christian Kastrop, um, you, you, you were uh, part of the design of Germany's fiscal rules and um, one of the questions that comes up occasionally is, um, so even if we do spend a lot now and even if we find a European solution to this, we need to return to the stability and growth pact and the fiscal rules both in Germany and at the European level. Um, do you think that's realistic? Um, do you think that, you know, after having increased debt to GDP ratio in Germany to 80%, we should, you know, make the same effort that we've done in the past to bring it back down to wherever it is today? And uh, the same at, at the European level, if we have all added 20% of GDP to our debt level, the European rules, at least currently, prescribe us to get that down to 60%, which in my view would, you know, mean a repeat of the, uh, of the mistakes after the, after the 2008-2009 financial crisis when, you know, support for the economy will, was withdrawn too quickly uh, because we are focusing on debt reduction. So, you know, this is still the legal framework within which we operate, but do you see an opportunity to change that? Yeah, thanks for that. So uh, I, I clearly think uh, and this is all what, what matters, meta studies show that in the very long run, I think there is a kind of a debt to GDP ratio we may still need as a kind of an anchor in any given system or, or fiscal rules. So uh, we did an OECD study some years ago and, and this can clearly show that debt to GDP levels between 60 and 80 are rather well founded. Of course, it depends from the history of each individual country. So given that anchor, I think uh, well, it was chosen for quite other reasons uh, 30 years ago, but I think we have this debt to GDP anchor and then it's the issue, uh, how are we doing the most important thing? And this is again different from the economic situation as a whole, and also it's given from uh, the national situation. Um, how do we keep uh, long-term sustainability of public finance? And uh, I think this is uh, where it's all about. Uh, um, I already have said in other circumstances that I find the link uh, to the so-called deficit rule of uh, the corrective arm uh, we, we right now have. It's very well known, everybody knows it. It's very, everybody's familiar with that. The political systems work with the, with the deficit rule. But if we think what is important, long-term fiscal sustainability, which is also been described in the European system with the preventive arm uh, and the measures were taken there. Um, and I think um, this is uh, the way forward. So I strongly believe that we have to change uh, the, the stability and growth pact uh, to the array which is uh, now spanned uh, by, the, uh, by the preventive arm. 
and of course already this has to be linked then more with macroeconomic support and with structural support so this that's it in a nutshell and of course the german system now having also view on that of course uh, it is in principle uh, triggered on, on long-term sustainability but of course uh, given the present conditions um, about growth rates and interest rates uh, of course, we have uh, within the German system now a convergence to debt to GDP levels, which are simply stupidly low. So and we do not need that. So and I think the Germans really have to think about uh, maybe having a breathing debt break where the debt to GDP anchor is, is the decisive point, which then can also be implemented uh, on the European level. So. I think uh, if we keep by and large this anchor of a debt to GDP level, we keep this way moving to a long-term sustainability path with, uh, I don't know, with a clever done uh, balanced budget rule or expenditure rule, that would be my point there, Christian. Thank you. Um, Eric Lonergan, um, you have asked already two questions, which I think is better if you post them yourself. Um, I think I can activate your video, can I? Um, or the co-moderators can do that. Yeah, I guess. Thanks. You know, one as one aspect of the debate that is ignored is is why does Italy have such a high debt to GDP ratio? And again, if I look at the Japanese case, I would largely say it's due to the the private sector running a large surplus as a structural feature of the economy. And of course, Germany is only able to sustain both a, a, a government sector surplus and a private sector surplus on such a scale because of a huge trade surplus. So as we know, it's a zero sum policy if it was replicated everywhere. But Italy has actually done, in a way, is doing a remarkable job of running a surplus, uh, both at the public sector and private sector level, again, through running a current account surplus. Um, but the interesting point to me is if I compare Italy and Japan, they, they look identical, except Japan is a lot worse in the conventional sense that the gross debt to GDP is even higher because the private sector has been running a bigger surplus for even longer. Um, of course, the BOJ, we can consolidate into the, the, into, the, into the government's balance sheet and we can net off the bonds. But I mean, arguably, we should consolidate the ECB on some shared capital key into the, you know, I guess that's a separate question. But my point is, is that if Europe doesn't help Italy, it's demanding an extreme price for Euro membership because we have the counterfactual, which is Japan. So the real, the key variable here is, is that the ECB has to guarantee that Italy can borrow at sustainable rates because Italy hasn't done anything wrong. It's a, it's a structural feature of its economy and we have a counterfactual. So I think one either has to say, Europe is going to finance this or the ECB has to target the spread. And I refer back to what Daniela said, which is, so maybe the ECB should just come out and say, right, we're gonna target the spread and the maximum spread from the lowest to the highest is 50 basis points. Thank you very much, Eric. And Martin Helwig, could, could I also um, get you to say what you just posted here on, on the chat? Fine, thank you. I'm a bit bothered in this discussion about the narrow focus on debt sustainability. Uh, with lots of Keteris Paribus assumptions about how the system is working. If I look at the Italian experience of the past 30 years, some of that experience has been driven by productivity shocks coming not from productivity, but from changes in world markets. Competition from China, competition from the what used to be called the accession countries, uh, have made life hard for certain uh, Italian industries. For example, the problems of the uh, Venetian banks that were closed a few years ago had a lot to do with um, sort of the leather industry in the Veneto, uh, not having the same market uh, position anymore as it did before. So one feature of the problem is to what extent is a country or an economy able to adjust to deal with problems that come from changes in world markets? The other question, and I submit that that's very much a question for uh, the corona crisis. What 
what's going to happen in these markets if and when they recover, I suspect we are not going to see a re-establishment of the same trade patterns at the same kinds of prices that we had before, which is something that might hit one country, but it's also something that must concern all of us, where there must be a community interest in making sure that uh, EU so economies in the EU altogether are uh, working sufficiently well so that we don't get a repeat of maladjustment experiences. Thank you. Um, I would like to make a final round for, for our panelists. Um, maybe they, they want to get back to some of the things that have been said. Um, but I also want them, because we have, there's the European Council meeting tomorrow, give us an idea of what the recovery fund ideally should look like and what the recovery fund should spend on. Because I think we've talked quite a bit about how it should be funded and that it should be grants. Um, but um, the question of what sort of recovery um, are we looking for? What should we target it on? What is, what is a good what is a good way to design this? So maybe maybe we can maybe we can start with with Jakob from Eitzeka on this one, and also you know for you to come back to some of the things that have been said. Yes, uh, Christian, thank you very much. Um, um, I want to um, avoid a little bit. I, I want to be transparent about it. I want to avoid a little bit venturing too far into I mean, given, given, given my present job. Um, but I want to start off where, where, where Martin Helwig left it. I think, um, I think one um, neat formula to put uh, one of the challenges of the post-corona environment is that um, I think there's a, there's a real danger that a precautionism is going to be the new protectionism. There's some people out there who didn't like, uh, um, you know, trade to start with, um, and there are other people out there who are now getting incredibly scared because they realize some of the supply chains are fragile, and uh, some of uh, um, some people draw the wrong conclusions from that by saying, well, because they're fragile, because we cannot be 100% certain that they'll be there forever. Um, uh, we we will um, we will severe them preemptively so that never ever will we get into trouble again, which would be very dangerous and would destroy a lot of wealth. Um, and uh, Italy would of course be affected, but, but frankly Germany would be affected even more um, if we went down that route of a um, precautionist protectionism. And I think there's a bit of a political danger. Um, in, in particular, because uh, I mean, the geopolitics was a bit protectionist before anyway, um, and we're going to have um, higher levels of unemployment. Um, and taken together, I think it's an environment uh, where we need to be aware of these challenges. And also, I agree with Martin Helwig um, that the new normal after Corona is going to be, look a little bit different from the uh, from the old normal before Corona. And that will re require certain um, economic adjustments, probably in all member states. So while I think um, it is exactly the right thing to do, not to say, well, we're going to do, say, an ESM program or make that um, a recovery fund only if you make enormous promises of structural reform. And um, I think at the same time, we need to get into a mindset where it's quite clear um, that we're not going to go back exactly to where we left it off before Corona. And I think that's important. That's important in, in, in many ways. And so I couldn't agree more. And, and sort of to try and uh, finally say a little bit about uh, the recovery fund, um, I, I think to the extent we can, I mean, money is fun, fungible. I think that's another piece of honesty. So even if we say member states need to spend exactly on that, this, that, or the other, if they would have spent it on this, that, or the other, in any case, uh, you know, they will have more money um, left to spend it on other things. But I would definitely wish um, for some of these funds to be spent um, on European public goods, because if we collect these, um, these funds at the European level, then I think to spend them collectively on something that is in favor of our common good is, is, is a very good idea to start with, irrespective of the corona crisis. 
and it makes it even, an even better idea, uh, I think, in the corona crisis. Public health clearly is, a, is, is, is not only European, a global public good, as, as we came to realize uh, during this crisis. But there are other areas where I think it would be tremendously useful. And then I think it would be useful to be honest about it if we want to um, um, ease certain, um, uh, um, uh, not only corona-related uh, difficulties in particular member states. Of course, we can come up with a uh, um, magical formula of why it needs to go exactly to this uh, member state. But, but I think in the end, you know, if Italy needs help, Italy should get help. Um, uh, um, and, and, and perhaps quite directly, rather than us uh, coming up with complicated schemes from DG Regio, um, imagining of why it is that uh, <laughs> yeah, the money ends up in one place. Uh, and, uh, and maybe it's a very different place to the one we think of. So we need to be careful not to be too bureaucratic about it. Thank you. Uh, Moritz, what is your ideal um, recovery plan and fund? I think you need to unmute your microphone. Yes. Um, look, I think after this journey that we all have had, um, I think the idea of having a one-off um, recovery plan sitting with the commission, but being targeted for Corona, I uh, financed by the transfer of maybe the revenues from the emissions um, CO2 trade to the commission, so they can um, service the debt over time seems to me for seems to me um, a good outcome. Um, I I am with Jakob and, and also with, with, with Martin Helwig that um, we do not know what what the future will bring. So um, the world will be different. Uh, my hunch is that it won't be different enough in terms of the growth rates to in terms of the growth prospects to um, they completely upset our debt sustainability calculations and by those I think uh, first of all in Germany we don't need to worry much with the increase that we've seen now uh, but in other countries we must so uh, we have to and and, and we'll we have in self-interest in setting up this fund. This being said maybe my last um, and, and probably most strongly felt intervention is I think the relative to the economic costs and I know this is hard to quantify but I think we've lost the first round of the PR battle on this as Europe. Um, it's been a cacophony, it's been bad. Um, the reactions in the South have been one of we've been left alone by a project that every politician talks about as a European solidarity project. And when it had to deliver, it wasn't there. And um, I think the, the cost of this, the political cost, if we fail, um, are going to be much, much larger than what we're discussing right now. So I think it's the, the biggest imperative of all is that somehow over the next weeks we develop a narrative that means that uh, Europe can look back in five years and say we somehow did it together and the technicalities, whether it's DGX or DGY who runs the Corona Fund, I really couldn't care less. I want it to be spent wisely and efficiently, of course, but I think that's I'm less interested in that than in the fact. Otherwise, you know, if we fail and the narrative remains what it is now, I think for the next 20 years, uh, populists in all countries, uh, when it comes to Europe, just have to utter the word Corona once. And it's clear to everyone that this Europe is not a real thing, but it's just something that is uh, is mentioned in, in Sunday afternoon speeches and isn't there for people when they need it. So I worry about this against the backdrop of, by the way, a decade of slow growth and political radicalization already. So I think that's my main um, uh, my main my main um, belief that uh, we all underestimating the potential um, political costs of not doing not standing together now. Thank you. Uh, Christian, um, yeah. you, you have had quite a bit of experience with designing European programs and know some of the pitfalls and, 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 and bureaucratic details. Um, so what, what, is, what do you feel is a, is, is a good way? What, what should something like that spend on? Yeah. So first of all, I think, uh, I hope, really hope we get a recovery funds. We get it a, a big one. We got it in the way uh, Jakob uh, says that we really make it a kind of a unique looking thing that it can really help where it needs to help and not uh, bound by uh, unwise uh, conditionalities, even indirect conditionalities. 
but uh, most of all, I think this is an instrument. This is really just an instrument. And uh, I would even enhance another layer. Or I would put another layer on top of what Jakob and Moritz just said. Uh, what we need, also not losing the PR battle, really having a new narrative for Europe. And if we talk about European common goods, I think we need a new structure in doing them. Uh, I think one issue is this famous European finance minister. What is it? It is a man or a woman uh, without any power to do anything without consensus in the council. So we need the sovereign superstructure, kind of a federal government for this European common goods where there can be decisions without asking all the time the council. I know this is very heretic now, again, for also for many Germans, but I think this new institutional design will be needed. It will be bound by subsidiarity, has to be bound by subsidiarity, but I think we need this own sovereign level and this pandemic for me shows really that, that uh, we will have we are in strong need of that or we will lose every PR battle as Moritz puts it again and again and again. And this will frustrate the citizens uh, to, to a degree which we will not foresee and it will enhance radicalism, populism and all these ugly things we do not want to have. Thank you. Sylvia. The last. Um, so I wanted to just spend a few words on the issue of debt. So why does ET debt is um, high debt Thank you, yeah. in, a few, um, in a few questions. So, I mean, um, the, the, it's true Italy did run uh, about a decade of primary surpluses that came after Italian GDP doubled from 60 to 120 percent in the 80s. So between 1980 and 1995, say, so following that, and that was not a denominator effect, that was, that was a numerator effect. So um, in that sense, I, uh, I'm not an expert about Japan, but I think this is a, uh, it, it wasn't exactly the same thing. So. Following 1995, we embarked on the series of primary surpluses, which were very high in the second half of the 90s, like four to six percent of GDP, which is really big, um, and then dropped to about one percent, two percent in the first half of the years 2000. So the, the debt to GDP ratio started declining, but then it stopped already before the global financial crisis. We're talking the uh, the Berlusconi government years. Um, to give you a rough idea of when uh, when this happened. So it went down from 120 to about 100. And then obviously the crisis came and then we had the, the denominator effect that brought the debt to GDP ratio back up uh, again. Um, but if you look at current expenditure net of interest costs, interest costs did decline massively with Italy joining the euro. Current spending excluding interest costs actually did not decrease that much, uh, both between 1995 and uh, mid-2000 and after 2010. So this is what I meant when I said the missed adjustment. I didn't say that to imply that Italy should not get help. Italy needs help quite clearly right now. I think it should get help, but I also think that as a, you know, like as an Italian, I think it would be uh, very realistic that you know, like we should, we, we as Italians should understand that unlike for other countries that might get in troubles, for Italy. Uh, this would be an act of faith on the side of, of its uh, European partners, which I'm not saying is, uh, is not needed or not warranted, but we should, we should frame the things as they are, uh, I believe. Now, coming to what, what form this should take uh, in terms of the EU recovery fund, if we get any agreement on that. Um, I think very much Martin was, was, um, was making a very good point about the fact that a lot of things are going to change for the future in the long term and structurally following this crisis and that the, like, the structural organization of economies and economic systems as we know it is going to be completely different after this. So ideally you want to invest, you want to understand forward-lookingly what this structural change will be, where the impact both across sectors and geographically will be the hardest and you want to invest to make sure that you counteract that and that those sectors and those areas will be prepared to, to then thrive following the emergency going forward, uh, even in this completely changed environment. So it would take a lot of forward looking uh, understanding of how the economy will change with, I'm not 100% sure we have right now, but hopefully 
if this gets agreed, it will build up uh, momentum for, uh, for looking into this. Thank you. I do have one final question, and that is about the distinction between Europe and the Eurozone, because we've occasionally in this discussion mixed this up, and I don't think we've been crystal clear about this. Um, there are differences, of course, um, in terms of access to your own central bank and so forth, but I wanted to ask Jakob von Weizsäcker to what extent this has been part of the discussion and what, what your assessment is on whether Central and Eastern European countries can and want to take part in this. I mean, my answer would be very brief. I think um, before Brexit, um, it was unforgivable um, not to make the distinction between EU and Euro area. Um, I think given the situation we're in right now with the Corona crisis and with Brexit, um, being a, a little bit casual about that distinction uh, maybe is acceptable. And um, I could even imagine uh, there are certain circumstances where it's not only forgivable, but even useful. So I, 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 my recommendation would be not to get overly worked up about it, uh, even though I agree, technically, it's very important. All right, thank you very much. Um, and with this, I think we can close this session and I just want to give the word back to Thomas Fricke who wants to moderate to um, the, the, the transition as it were uh, to the next session. Thomas. Yeah, but just to, to pick up what I said at the beginning, uh, Silvia, I think that's a very important question on how to, to know if Italians rightly feel that they have done austerity uh, in the last years and it didn't help, which is one of the arguments that uh, was brought um, which makes it difficult now to to have another round of austerity or to to accept that there's no, not more solidarity i mean it's in the sense it's hugely important because um i mean you say maybe there has not been as much reduction in 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 spending and there are a lot of numbers around but the curious thing is that if you look at the German figures, at the German numbers, Germans feel, and if you look and if you listen to the public debates and some reaction to the crisis now, feel like we have done a lot. We have done the right thing and we have done, we don't call it austerity, but uh, sparsam sein and, and, and so on. But if you look at the numbers, Germans have not been so restrictive. I mean, if, if you look at the the, the the primary there's no primary surplus until some years ago uh, only there's not been such a reduction in, in structural deficits and and, and 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 so on at least at the time when people felt it was which is i mean it's, it's tricky there has been reductions there has been some structural reforms but it's not as much as germans feel <laughs> and that's the difference between germans and germans have been very lucky in the last 10 years because there have been other very positive developments, which have nothing to do with structural reforms. And uh, Italians have been very unlucky um, because they did a lot of reforms, but it didn't feel like um, they are gaining now the, the fruits of, of these reforms. So I think that's in, at, at the center of understanding the psychology of, of people in, in, in Germany and in Italy, which is one at the heart also to find the narrative, the right narrative for Italians and for Germans to, to go ahead. I mean, if, if the stories are told like they are, it's difficult to bring both together. So that's just to uh, have a last word on, on, on this discussion. Um, we have some, some uh, time, 10 minutes, uh, to have a short break before we do this, the last session, um, which will be about the broader prospect of uh, how to design and how to make our societies, our economies more uh, resilient, which is I mean, maybe also make the eurozone more resilient, but it's about more, much more than than that, uh, and see how we can we avoid to have such or other shocks in in future and make our societies more resilient. So I invite you to to join again in ten minutes, um, uh, five forty-five, and thanks um, to Christian to have uh, chaired this session and to all the participants uh, i mean it's been another very uh, fruitful and, and excellent uh, session thanks a lot and see you back in 10 minutes